Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin, and we have a website at rce-cast.com, and there you can find a nomination form where you can tell us about other things you want to show. You can also find a link to Jeff's blog and all of our Twitter accounts on there. And Jeff is with me again. Jeff from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI has been a wonderful support and alternative viewpoint oh, in these shows. So, Jeff, you thanks again for helping me out. You are far too kind, Brock. Thank you yeah. very much. You're far too kind. Yeah. Uh, another, uh, since we kind of have to obligatory mention our, our our indirect sponsors here, have a look at my blog out there. It's it's about MPI and HPC kinds of things. If you got any kind of burning question about uh, why does MPI do this or what uh, what's a particular viewpoint or view take on on uh, you know high performance networking things like that, feel free to give me a shout out. I, I do blog solicitations, so to speak. So you know, feel free to ask your questions. I'd love to talk about this stuff because this. This is my world. But by and, that token, we have something a little different today, right, Brock? Yes, yes. But quickly, again, Jeff's blog is linked off the rce-cast.com webpage, and it'll take you straight to his blog at Cisco. But yes, today our guest is Michael DeHaan from Puppet Labs and the Puppet Project, and it appears to be some sort of provisioning and system management system, but I'll let him explain that. Uh, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved with Puppet? Sure. Um, right. So um, I do product management for Puppet Labs and kind of help Puppet along with uh, various miscellaneous things and strategy and conferences and you know kind of figuring out where the next generation of our systems management platform is going to be. But uh, been following Puppet for several years now. I was at Red Hat in my previous position and uh, where I created the Cobbler project and also did a lot of work on Funk, if anybody has used uh, that platform. And Puppet really was impressive to me because, to me, it's been one of the most absolutely successful projects in terms of building up open source community around getting systems together to share content and work together towards common goals of automating very, very large computer systems. And uh, seeing that level of cross-platform application and and the complete breadth of a, of a solution is in, in all in open source is really, really neat to see. So um, I've joined them in the last, I think, three or four months. And uh, it's been a very great experience talking to a lot of the same users and that kind of thing. So uh, I think we have a lot of interesting places we can, we can take it. But yeah, Puppet's uh, an automation platform. So it builds a model of the way your data center config needs to be from a centralized perspective and rolls it out and makes your systems look like you want them to look. And it's not just initial provisioning, but also uh, full life cycle management. So I don't have to reinstall a machine to uh, apply a new configuration and things like that. So what's one of the, or some of the main features that a sysadmin looking at using Puppet, like what would they even originally be looking for for uh, Puppet? Sure. Um, so a lot of times when people, I mean, I guess at the very basic level, right, people are still doing things manually. They'll go ahead and stick a CD in and install an operating system and then manually install and configure their packages. And that doesn't scale beyond, you know, five systems or so, right? Um, and then a lot of times people will build hand-rolled scripts to do these types of things. So a bunch of shell scripts and automation. Um, that kind of infrastructure takes a really long time to build up, and a lot of times people will build in-house tools. But the idea is, can we all get together to share a common tool that has um, really, really good features and has been really, really well thought out versus having to kind of build these systems ourselves in all these different uh, corporate environments? So if you go from one job to another, I can go ahead and pick the same tool off the shelf and reuse it. So that's a really powerful concept. So, yeah, Puppet's really intended to replace those kind of shell scripts and Perl scripts and kind of in-house systems, SSH loops, and uh, replace it with a more uh, better model of your data center. I think one of the interesting uh, things about Puppet is it's got something called the resource abstraction layer, right? So we have, a, we have a way to talk about a user. But if you're managing a user on a Solaris box, and you're managing a user on a Linux box, the commands that you use may be just ever so slightly different. Uh, if you're managing a user on OS X, it's ever so slightly different. But in uh, Puppet language, um, you can actually describe a user in a relatively cross-platform way, and then depending on what system you uh, run that recipe, that manifest, you'll be able to um, 
instantiate that user in a cross-platform sort of way, and it's very, very lightweight, easy to use, and it's a very high-level conceptual thing. So if I'm talking about a user, I might be modifying their password file, I might be modifying the group's file all, all at once, but I can just represent that as one concrete concept rather than blasting out this config file and running this command. One of the other things that's really interesting about it is it has a, it's a declarative system. So when we say that a particular um, resource needs to look like something, Puppet will make it look like that rather than saying, uh, go here and run these commands. Because if you think about it, it's kind of like a travel analogy. Say I want to get to um, Washington, D.C., for instance. Well, for me, that's driving north. But if you, if you script that, you don't want to say drive north because you might actually be in Chicago. So Puppet allows you to really say, I want to ensure this user is here and he has these attributes and only run these commands if you have to. Um, and that goes from services, so you don't restart services unnecessarily, that you don't copy files unnecessarily, um, and that you have a really, really good model of what your system needs to look like, and then Puppet makes your data center match that description. So let's take a, a step back here for a second here. Let, let's draw a, a clear distinction. So uh, you mentioned that you're at Puppet Labs, but you're working on Puppet and there is a community. Could you delineate, you know, what, what are the differences and what, what are each of these things? Oh, sure. So uh, the Puppet project was started by our CEO, Luke Canise, about five and a half or so years ago. And we've recently incorporated Puppet Labs with, you know, funding from True Ventures or the people who do WordPress and it's lots of other great projects and several other investors. And we're essentially doing services and support while also helping build out and continue Puppet. So um, it's really kind of one and the same thing, but we have a lot of contributors in the open source project. Uh, the mailing list has over like 1,600 people all helping each other out and sharing content and uh, helping review the code and contribute features and things like that. So very much classical open source services and support model kind of thing. Okay, so I think you just answered my question there was, uh, you know, why did you guys incorporate? You know, if, if, if it's a good open source community, you mentioned you were at Red Hat before, so I'm kind of guessing that Red Hat is one of the participants and contributors. Is that, is that right? Um, well, Red Hat uses Puppet quite a lot. Um, they're not actually um, a part of our entity, so to speak, right? But, um, yeah, Red Hat uses it for managing Fedora infrastructure and a lot of their own internal systems. And they're they're pretty big fans and have made some good contributions in the past. So uh, okay. we also do uh, cool. we're also doing some work with uh, Canonical right now for their cloud, which is uh, really nice to see. And we're, we're going to up to uh, Ubuntu Developer Summit in about a month if the volcano dies down and uh, talk to those guys <laughs> a little bit. So oh, that's cool. A lot of neat so stuff you're going looking, on. you know, by incorporating, you're looking to do both support as as Puppet is becoming commoditized and more popular you know, kind of bringing Puppet to the common enterprise shop? Is that kind of where you're thinking of going? Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're there a lot of cases already. So um, a lot of people that have very large Puppet systems, you know, approaching, uh, even if they just have 100 machines or maybe they have 40,000 machines, these people do need, you know, some help with their environments, and we're there to provide that. We also do training for Puppet. So there's a class in Washington, D.C. that's coming up next month, for instance. That's a public training, and we also do like on-site trainings if if people want to learn about Puppet. And uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of other things we can do with support too. Like if you need help writing uh, custom plugins for Puppet, is one thing that we can help you out with. So if you have a resource that maybe Puppet doesn't manage very well today, we can work with you to develop that resource and get that resource kind of open source, and then let everybody have access to it, which is a really neat thing to be doing. So you mentioned that uh, Red Hat uses it heavily, but you also mentioned Canonical, the guys who make Ubuntu. So does Puppet use the underlying native package manager, and there's like a plug-in for apt-get and a plug-in for yum for doing RPMs, and there's a plug-in for yast. How, how does Puppet actually handle that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So Puppet has a type and provider system. So what it is is we have a basic concept of a package which says install this package at this version, and depending on what operating system you're on, you, you get a certain default provider. So you use YUM on you know, Fedora or Red Hat or CentOS systems, and you'll use apt on um, Debian or Ubuntu systems, for example. And then if you want to use